Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is William Nixon from the University of Glasgow, and I'm a member of the RLUK's Digital Shift Working Group. I'm delighted to be chairing today's session uh, on data and information for sustainable living and future from Govinda Chowdhury, for, who's a professor of information science at the University of Strathclyde, um, also here in Glasgow. Um, I think today's talk is very timely. And I think as we all live through the, the pandemic and the experiences of, of COVID-19, this has really underscored the challenge of digital inequity and digital poverty, which um, is experienced not only um, by ourselves in our libraries and the academic sector, but also kind of more broadly and widely in society. Uh, Gobinda is a professor of information science at the Department of Computer and Information Sciences at Strathclyde. And he's been involved in teaching and research in information science for over 25 years. And he's taken on senior management positions at universities in the UK and Australia. Currently, Gabinda is the chair of the Global iSchools organization, and his research focuses on digital libraries and information services, trying to understand how people access and use information and data in different contexts. So Gabinda's recent research also includes information systems and services for addressing global challenges and sustainable development. And it's really kind of this that he is going to uh, bring to the bring to the party today and you know, explore with us. So I hand over to Gabinda and thank you so much for your time this afternoon in presenting for us. Hello everyone, um, thank you. Um, thank you for attending. And first of all, um, thank you um, to uh, Matt uh, and, and William and RLUK in general for giving me this opportunity to share some of my research ideas, research experience with you all. And uh, as you will note that, um, you know, I have more questions than answers, but let's share this, uh, these questions um, and let's see whether together uh, in the near future, we can find some answers. So as you can see, the, the title uh, of my talk is Data and Information for Sustainable Living and Sustainable Future. So that's kind of, you know, my current um, area of interest. But again, you know, for sustainable living, sustainable future, data and information is the foundation. So obviously I'm coming from that perspective, data and information. Um, so the, the, there are three key bullet points here that kind of set the foundation for, for this presentation. Two of them are statements that you, you all know. Uh, um, sort of this community, for example, is already a converted um, community. So, you know, you all know that data and information is the fuel for, for today's uh, information and knowledge society, knowledge economy. Uh, and of course, you know, there is a huge digital shift that is, um, you know, taking place around us uh, in every aspect, everything that we do, um, everything that we kind of, you know, we live uh, for, um, and everything that we um, do for living. Now, the third bullet point is slightly provocative. Um, and this is increasingly, I am beginning to realize uh, and feel that we are living in an increasingly technology rich, but, but information poor world. And this information poverty is the key theme of my talk today. Um, broadly speaking, information poverty is defined as kind of lack of access to information and data, and people are considered information poor. And I would like to sort of use data and information both in that context. They are considered as data and information poor if they can, do not have access to information, if they do not know how to access and use information in, in everyday living life and also for whatever they do. Now, information poverty and the poverty as a word, there is a significant difference. Uh, and the first difference that we should know that often people do not know that they are data or information poor. Now, 
in terms of poverty, which is, you know, again, uh, even sustainable development goal, and then that is, <clears throat> excuse me, defined by uh, some measures, for example, uh, information poverty is, uh, sorry, uh, poverty is measured um, by the United Nations, as the, I think the recent um, um, document says that it's um, measured by, uh, you know, if family, if, sorry, $1.90 per person per day, if that is, you know, any family lives below that income uh, level, that $1.90 per day, then they are considered as, as severely, information, severely poor. However, with regard to information poverty, we really do not have any yardstick to measure. We do not really have an accepted kind of standard, global standard as to what we mean by information poor. How do we measure that, you know, people at different levels of information poverty and so on and so forth. So that will form part of, of my discussion today. Um, we will see that information poverty and its eradication um, requires work at multiple fronts and multiple levels. And we will see that uh, often uh, measuring the impact of and, and benefits of information poverty is difficult. And often it is sort of linked to various other things because you know, as we all know, the information need is not a primary need, it is a secondary need. So therefore, it is the secondary thing that we are going to do and that for which we need the information and we want to use the information. When that is fulfilled and what result it produces, what impact it has, what outcome it has, that may be attributed to uh, the availability of information or um, in, in other way that uh, is improving or, or reduction in information poverty. So um, information poverty can be caused by, we all know, uh, lack of uh, relevant data and information. That's the first thing. And we will see that, you know, uh, particularly with regard to sustainable development, you know, we will see with some data that, uh, you know, data and, and information is not easily available, even at the government level or even at kind of, you know, national and international level. Of course, lack of access, and, and that is where the digital um, divide uh, comes in. Again, we'll look at some data. Digital skills, now information skills and digital skills, we'll you know, spend a little bit of time on that and see how one complements another. Uh, increasingly sort of you know, uh, misinformation, disinformation and infodemic, this is becoming uh, a challenge. And the, again, you know, information poverty can be, you know, caused by misinformation and disinformation that people may be kind of, you know, put into a disadvantageous position. And particularly with, with the pandemic, we have seen that how this can create a huge impact on people's life and living and, and society as a whole. Then, of course, uh, you know, there is a lack of adequate governance and policies that may be also another cause of uh, information poverty. Uh, I will explain very briefly uh, with some of my experience working with some African countries over the past um, two, three years with some GCRF projects, uh, how uh, governance policies and how adequate sort of, you know, understanding of people and awareness that make people more uh, information poor. Now, there are, you know, various factors, also secondary factors that cause information poverty which could be kind of based, you know, created and caused by general lack of education and literacy, socioeconomic condition, age, gender. Again, we will look at some of this uh, in the context of, of the UK data that we have. Um, of course, there are, you know, physical disabilities. There are also the different constraints uh, around that and how that affects information poverty. Again, we'll, we'll take a look at some data. Um, lack of understanding of data, number and statistics, I think that's again a key challenge with regard to data and information. Uh, and, um, and often sort of, you know, a lot of um, assumptions go in there. For example, we all have seen that, uh, you know, a lot of data is thrown at us uh, with regard to the, the recent pandemic. And, you know, say for example, if we say that, okay, today's death um, for, from COVID-19 has been, let's say, 600. 
what does that mean how do you contextual contextualize it is it sort of good thing bad thing is there a co cause for concern how does it compare with previous data how does it compare with other countries so a lot of context is needed to make sense of data to understand data and that is where a, a combination of technical skills or digital skills rather and a, you know some higher order skills are needed we'll, we'll take a quick look at that as well and of course there are also some cultural and behavioral practices that may cause you know influence significantly and maybe a big causal factor for information poverty again um, we have seen some examples for example with regards to the covid-19 pandemic you know there are some cultural um, kind of you know um, correlations with or cultural practices associated uh, with refusing to take covid-19 vaccine for example and there have been some efforts made by you know various um, cultural communities to try and persuade people and to alleviate um, that fear and so on so again you know there could be a number of secondary factors that might cause information poverty so what we will do is we'll take a look at some of the data in the context of all of these things that we have discussed uh, as as information poverty in the context of uh, you know some of these things like we will take a look at the internet access and digital divide in the uk um uh, what i would like to at the end of this discussion i'd like to sort of you know uh, put forward to you that what my belief is and what my thought around information poverty is one level is of course into this digital world and especially as we started with this basic premise that there is a digital uh, shift around us having access to internet uh, or you know reducing the digital divide is one of the key requirements that people should have access to to the internet and again you know uh, you know recently we have seen all of this uh, all over the media that uh, you know this homeschooling caused by the the um, pandemic and and the closed down measures lockdown measures we have seen that you know how people struggle uh, you know children are struggling to get access to um, their um, digital education uh, because of lack of internet because of lack of um, you know um, appropriate devices and so on fortunately there have been some measures you know um, a lot of um, donations and a lot of uh, you know uh, laptops and and devices are being uh, made available to children uh, and then there is a government uh, push as well and and also from civil society push as well to persuade um these um internet service providers to reduce the tariff because uh, and and mobile phone providers to reduce the tariff because there have been some some estimations that you know using um homeschooling um, that that on uh, digital education with uh, through the mobile devices could cost hundreds of pounds to families which could be really really devastating uh, for many families under this situation so internet and digital divide digital um, internet access digital divide is one of the things but then that is only one condition then having access to internet does not necessarily guarantee that everyone will be able to access information do whatever is expected or required i have got some research in that area i'll try to draw some kind of references to that um, in a while uh, then the second point uh, the sorry the the other point that is important in, with regard to digital skills is again digital skills is not it is a necessary requirement but not the sufficient requirement so having access to internet and the devices is important the necessary condition then you know having digital skills is the second necessary condition but then information skills also equally important and i will so information skills and data skills increasingly that is becoming also a, a kind of an expectation and a requirement and then we will also take a look at uh, this at a um, gener general population level uh, in the context of sustainable development and where we stand stand um, both in uk and internationally so this is kind of the context uh, within which we will um, have our conversation today um this is the data from um, you know when a statistics which shows kind of the internet um, access and use now this is um, kind of this digital divide is measured uh, by how people access and use internet and this is the definition that is used internationally and that is also used in the uk is that uh, people using 
people never using internet or people not using the internet within the past three months. So as you can see, you know, the, the, the line at the bottom here that shows that the 2018 figure. So this is the latest data available uh, from the report that came out last year. Um, there is still kind of, you can see that there is about, except for London and, and Southeast uh, and East, over 10% there people actually do not have internet access. Okay, so they, there is a digital divide in, you know, we can say um, that at this. And then Northern Ireland is, is, is much higher, it's close to 15%. So as we can see that, you know, if you take, take a kind of a baseline of 10%, a significant proportion of the population still do not have the internet access. This is the latest data. There is also a huge gender difference here. Now, although over the years, so this one shows the, the, the line on top shows um, women and, and then at the bottom is, is men. You can see that, you know, this has dropped. However, the gap still remains. And the, the gap from 2016 to 2018, almost like over a million population still remains. So the first slide shows that there is more than 10% population still sort of, you know, um, do not have internet access. And th this slide shows that there is a huge, uh, there is a significant gender difference and that is not bridging. So this is the data that shows that there is age is a major factor. 28% of those um, aged over 60 are offline. And, um, you know, 29% was in 2017. Now 2018, this is 28%. So it's still a significant, it's not dropping significantly. And again, 25% of those people who are registered, disab registered disabled people, they do not have access um, to the internet. And they are four times more likely to not to be online. So this is, this is quite significant because if we want to bring the entire population and into the digital world, um, then uh, these are the people who are most vulnerable. Um, the next slide shows, again, these are the age groups, um, you know, 65 to 74 and over 75. This, this number, this, this group of people still is quite significant in terms of not having access to the internet. So, as we have seen in the previous slide and this slide, uh, and more details are available in, in, in this ONS report, and you can find the reference at the, um, in my last slide. It clearly shows that you know, people who are more vulnerable, elderly people, or people with you know, some physical disabilities, et cetera, they need more. They need to have ac access to the internet service, the digital services more, and yet they are excluded, digitally excluded. Now, so digital exclusion in the context of you know having access to internet is one measure. As we have seen, uh, I, I said before that you know this is the first condition that people should have access to the internet to get um, you know to be able to use the digital um, information systems and services. But then there are these are the five basic digital skills that have been identified, and there is a, a national report that I will see soon. Soon see that these are the five um, digital skills that are considered to be essential to be able for people to be able to use digital information systems and services. What we see from a recent data: eight percent of the population have zero basic skills. So even if they have internet access, they do not have the skills to use the the digital systems and services. 21% of our population do not have all five skills. That means they have some skills and they do not, but they do not have all. 43% of the pe people population do not know how to sort of, you know, create, you know, new um, products from images, music, video, etc., which is often a requirement in some cases. And I did some research last year before last. Um, and part of last year with uh, the Newcastle City Council trying to understand uh, how people access and use some of the council services. And we found that, you know, some of the requirements for the council services, for example, if you are applying for a, a you know, disability um, badge for your car, 
or if you are uh, asking for you know some kind of council rebate for your um, you know some of your services and, and so on or council tax and so on there are expectations that you know people should be able to you know scan their different documents and then you know select the right kind of file format upload them properly and so on and this creates a lot of stress and anxiety amongst people particularly those who need them most and our study was actually focusing on what is the the kind of impact of that digital divide and how people are are kind of being affected we have a paper coming up um you know um in in a journal and we hope to expand that study to understand that how the current provision of digital services by government and council actually are used by people who are most sort of need it and most vulnerable people and what are the hidden costs of, of those again um you know this is something I, and i'm kind of you know marked it red because this is something alarming nearly a quarter of our population do not or do not know how to verify the sources of information that they use so no wonder that there is so much of misinformation disinformation and infodemic and this is something extremely important that if we really want to take our our society to the digital world they should really understand and know you know how to judge the authenticity of of the and trustworthiness of the information and so on and of course you know the last point shows that there is kind of a financial uh, or or economic relationship between uh, the digital skills so people families who have um, more than 40000 pounds per year income they are nearly 50% more likely to have the basic digital skills so there is again we can see that there is not only a gender difference or, or sorry age difference and, and disability also there is some kind of household income that plays a, a, a role Uh, this is the regional difference again sort of you know uh, in terms of the five digital skills so this is the line that shows almost sort of you know um 20% 18% actually um overall um who are kind of you know who do not have the basic digital skills so therefore that proportion or that cross section of of our population they really sort of you know fall out of um this um you know digital um world now this this slide i purposely wanted to sort of show side by side again sort of you know i'm talking to a, a community of people who are experts in this and they clearly understand this but i just wanted to uh, you know point this out that first we discussed the you know um, digital divide in terms of having access to internet then we discussed the digital skills but having digital skills are again necessary uh but not sufficient condition for people to be able to make uh, you know use of information because accessing interpreting and analyzing information needs you know somewhat higher level of cognitive skills because this is this is not only sort of you know a, a simple training cannot let or cannot you know help people do that it needs a, a lot more analytical skills a lot more cognitive skills and understanding to understand and interpret and analyze information and also to share information and this is again we have seen in 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 the context of pandemic that a lot of information has been shared uh, to create you know and and spread rumor because people do not understand you know there is a and this is something i i wouldn't blame people i would blame also in a way the world has quickly moved over the past 20 or so years now if you talk to uh, you know people they often think that oh this is what i found through a google search and therefore the underlying assumption is that that information must be correct because it is available uh, you know in the digital form in digital form and and can be searched through google and as a corollary if something cannot be found by a google search and i'm using google as a search engine not by name uh, any search engine if we cannot find that that does not exist now you know i sometimes smile we all know especially if we work you know in a, in the organization where you work and i face that i know that i have seen this document in my university somewhere i cannot find it where is it so if i cannot find it by a simple search i should not necessarily assume that it does not exist on the you know other hand if i do a search and if i see that the first few results i should not really assume that they are the best possible results so this difference that how the search engines operate 
why, why the results, some results come on top and how they are ranked, we do not know. And people should know about it and people should try and make use various other kind of you know, uh, types of uh, knowledge and skills to ascertain uh, the value of the information. And therefore they should analyze and interpret accordingly as well as they should share the information accordingly. So the hidden costs of information, again, um, we know uh, there are direct and indirect costs. There are direct costs is simple that if people you know, fall out of, uh, of the service, cannot make use of that service, then obviously you know, they, they lose out. But there are indirect costs as well. We found, for example, that in Newcastle City Council, they have created a, a lot of um, you know, service facilities, which is like call center facilities or even you know, um, drop-in sessions within the various libraries where you know, people can book an appointment, they can come with their problem, then the person sits with them and takes them step by step. And often, you know, people have to make more than one trip in order to accomplish a particular task. Because in the first instance, they may not know what kind of document they have to bring in. They bring in the document the second time, for example, and then they have to be scanned and they have to be kind of uploaded and so on and so forth. So there is a direct cost for the, for the users, for the you know, population that people who want to use that. There is an indirect cost also to provide support for this. So often, you know, the digital uh, only or, or, or digital by choice, uh, service is do not necessarily reduce the cost, you know, uh, on every front. There is a huge, you know, psychological as well as physical cost, um, you know, harms, etc., through misinformation, fake news, infodemic, and so on. We all have seen, you know, uh, you know examples of that and how um, there is a huge kind of, you know, pressure now on uh, the social media companies, for example to ensure that they have, they put in place some measures to restrict misinformation, fake news, in, and, and particularly with regard to pandemic, infodemic, and, and so on. At workplace, again, there is a huge impact, and this is these are all based on, on, on these uh, statistics, that currently 10% of the workforce do not have the basic digital skills. And people who earn less, they are likely to have less digital skills. So there is again, you know, something there is a national overall national loss or loss for, for a particular business. So this is, you know, so far we have talked about, you know, overall um, in, in general, uh, the impact of um, information poverty and then what are the different factors that cause Let's take a quick look at the sustainable development goals and, and some of the reports from there. Now, we all know that sustainable development goals were kind of, you know, 17 sustainable development goals were um, introduced in 2015 by the United Nations and all countries, almost all countries in the world signed up to that. And there is um, and kind of, you know, 2030 is, uh, is the deadline by which there are certain targets and those targets have to be achieved. Now we are, now in the five years of this 15 year period. So we had almost one third of our way through. Let's take a look at where we are with regard to the availability of data and information related to sustainable development. What I did was I took a few lines from some of the reports, especially the report from the ONS, uh, you know, government, um, UK government report on sustainable development that came out last year, late last year. And also, you know, the UN Global Report on Sustainable Development. The head of ONS says that no country in the world collects data on all the targets and indicators. So we really do not have the mechanism to collect data related to sustainable development and related to sort of, you know, various things that we measure, like how we are performing in certain areas of, of sustainable development goals. So on the one, so far we, what we have seen is the, the causes of information poverty in, relate, you know, in the context of digital divide, in the context of digital skills, in the context of information skills, uh, et cetera. And those are you know, some of the uh, challenges associated with the technology and associated with people and their, their skills and capabilities and so on. However, information poverty can also be caused by the lack of standards, lack of metadata, lack of a framework 
because what it says is that some SDG indicator gaps remain challenging because the indicator gaps are difficult to measure. Like, for example, if you look at the ONS statistics, you will find that, and we'll see, soon see, we'll find that there are certain obvious gaps in, in relation to some of the indicators. Some of the data is very old. Even report says that, for example, the poverty related indicators, as well as the indicators on gender inequality um, uh, and the sustainable cities goal 11, um, et cetera. These are the latest data is 2016. So it's good four or five years data gap there. And even also recognizes that we need some measures to protect people from this data so that the data should not be misused or abused. So with regard to data creation, there are challenges associated with standards and how we collect data, how we make that data available and how quickly we can you know, um, collect and update that data. And also how we protect people and how we protect sort of, you know, uh, how you take measures and governance and, and policies so that data cannot or should not be misused. Um, there is one example here, like goal 16, uh, for example, which, which uh, says that everybody should have access to information. Again, how it is protected, the measure, even measure is that the, how many countries do have these acts. Now this is in the UK, we have these acts. So how many countries have Freedom of Information Act? How many countries have you know, Data Protection Act? Last year, around this time, actually, end of January, first week of February, uh, as part of my project, I was running a workshop in Kenya, Nairobi. And that was with the Information Commissioner's Office and also a, a number of senior officials from, from uh, the you know, Kenyan government offices and also a number of academics. Even if they have this act, nobody has a clue as to how to collect that data and what is the governance mechanism, how we handle that, you know, uh, and how we respond to one of the Freedom of Information Act uh, requests and so on. So there are different levels of, you know, facilities and infrastructure and, and, and understanding even training and skills for people who should manage this information. And then and only then this will work. And then and only then, you know, you can generate data as to how many FY requests you got and then how many of them were addressed and so on. This is, this is again, sort of, you know, the data availability. This is the awareness statistics as to, you know, uh, it says that 81% of the data is available. However, however, there is, there is a problem there. The problem being that, you know, data desegregation is important because data is does not make any sense if you really cannot understand that data and cannot really bring it down to some meaningful um, conclusion and meaningful analysis and and so on so these are some of the you know this this uh, color codes shows partially desegregated so if you see a number of good health and well-being reduced inequalities um, and and say responsible consum consumption etc they are partially desegregated and a lot of them are not aggregated at all. So not disaggregated, sorry, not disaggregated at all. Life and land, for example, not disaggregated at all. So what does it mean? It means that this data is available, but in a very crude form. And therefore you cannot really make any sense of it. Here is a slide very quickly sort of, you know, so that you, you um, can see why data uh, disaggregation is important. And this is again taken from one of the um, sustainable development reports. It gives us some figure that 6.3% of women experienced partner abuse. Okay. And apparently it shows okay that it really does not um, differ that much, but if you disaggregate that data, then you can find you know, different factors that are causing this. And that is where data and information is important. That is where you know, people can make decisions, people can take you know, appropriate measures and, and so on. But you know, a lot of data is still not um, disaggregated and not available at that level. With regard to awareness within the business, again, this was a study commissioned by the government, conducted by Deloitte recently, and then they, they have four categories. Champions are, as we know all, fellow travelers are sort of beginning to sort of take part and measures in sustainable development. Explorers are sort of not there yet, not engaged or totally sort of do not know. So amongst all those sort of participants who responded in that survey, as you can see that 
there are you know private businesses and and investors they are still sort of less than 25% private businesses are very small champion and then some are just moving so in general what we can see is that there is a lack of awareness from various stakeholders businesses as well uh, uh, and, uh, and and as well as investors in with regard to sustainable development so quick um, sort of you know um, to, to wrap up um, what do you think um, we should do? Now, here are some of my thoughts. Uh, certainly, sort of, you know, there may be kind of, you know, more discussions needed. Uh, open access and resource sharing, that is important. And there have been, with regard to sustainable development, there have been some initiatives. But with regard to other sort of, you know, we all know, for example, that within the library world, it needed uh, you know, several years to move into this open access and then open access repositories and so on. And yet, I know that is again one of my areas of research. We have we are far from kind of you know open access repositories and user centered services for research data, for example. And with research data, again, that's a completely sort of different area of research. And I can give another kind of, you know, one hour lecture easily on, on research data management and what are the key challenges. But, you know, this is some area, open access and resource sharing is an area where more research is needed. People and context specific design of information systems that is important because often there is a lot of assumption that goes in in designing information systems and services. And there is, you know, sometimes people are expected to learn, people are expected to know a lot of things. Now, one of the problems with the technology world that it changes over very quickly. Even we all know as a professional that, you know, when we get a new version of a software, we get a new tool, we still need to spend a bit of time to familiarize ourselves. ourselves. And then also we know that, you know, when we use the service, you know, after three months or six months, when we go back, they may they may have changed the look and feel of the site may have changed or that some of the design may have changed. So again, this has to be sort of you know constantly sort of people centered design should be the focus. Data standards is an important and then with regard to I have been studying very closely all the metadata standards and and so on for sustainable development. There is still sort of you know in a number of areas. Um, developing metadata standard is sort of, you know, uh, at a very early stage. We in the information world know more about metadata standard, more about user and context specific design and so on. This is something where you can definitely contribute. Advocacy and awareness, this is something we should um, really, we, we can contribute. Information education and research programs, in my view, as a, being an educator, you know, we should try and 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 sort of, you know, uh, revisit this and I have got my own thoughts on that and digital information skills for everyday life and living this has to be constantly updated and then we, we can contribute. I'll finish with this um, UNDP data ecosystems, uh, you know, this is again a, a, a group of um, organizations, experts from around the world came together to create data ecosystems and within this ecosystem, they have come up with various research ideas. And um, this I just came um, sort of, you know, I, I found accidentally. And you can see, you know, some of these areas I highlighted, some of these areas are similar to what I uh, sort of pointed out. Uh, I think I should take, um, I should stop here. Um, I've spoken for quite some time and uh, probably this is the time when uh, I should take some questions. I've got a, a, a list of um, sites and, and a couple of my papers. Um, so if you know if you want to know more about it, by all means, you know um, you can uh, you can email me. But if you have any questions, and I'll try and uh, and answer them now. Thank you, Kabinda. Um, we've had a number of questions come in as well. So I would, but first of all, I think um, behalf of the Digital Shift Forum and uh, my colleagues attending, first of all, thank you very, very much for your provocations and, you know, opportunities to kind of you know, think about think about that. Um, I'm going to share some some questions from colleagues. Um, clearly, you, you know your audience. Uh, but one of the, a couple of the questions uh, kind of tie into kind of 
public libraries and kind of asking about kind of some of your research um, about the potential role or the current role for local public libraries in terms of that digital literacy, digital skills and media and kind of, and then by extension of public libraries, kind of that heritage sector. Yeah, certainly. Um, let, let me uh, try and answer them, um, you know, in two parts. Public libraries have, have, have a huge significant role in sort of, you know, not only um, improving the kind of reading and literacy of, of community, but also in the digital world to enable them to use um, the digital information uh, safely, uh, easily, but more importantly, as we can see uh, increasingly responsibly, because that is where the, the key challenge comes. Now, one of the problem, well, there are a lot of benefits of social media, a lot of benefits of the internet and so on. One of the things, one of the, the vice of that, and that is major, is that it is very difficult to judge. It is very difficult. And that, that is in some, you know, some sense, in the printed world, we all knew that there has been some kind of peer review process has gone through it and there has been some kind of control mechanism. Whereas in today's digital world, one of the key problems is that there is no direct control and it is very difficult to know where the information is coming from and also whether the information is trustworthy. And that's the key challenge. And you know, public libraries, there have been some efforts to create awareness amongst um, young people, for example, at, at school level and, and, and so on. But I think public libraries have a key role to play. Now, again, public libraries have their constraints and the constraints being sort of, you know, we all know that the, you know, they have been severely affected by budget cut and so on. But my personal belief is that both in terms of, you know, creating digital citizens of tomorrow's world and creating people, you know, who are responsible for creating a sustainable world public libraries can play a key role. And there is definitely more engagement and more kind of, you know, context specific uh, research is needed. With regard to cultural heritage information, again, that's, uh, you know, another of my, my area of research. Um, now, we often, you know, this is where we, in a way, kind of, I would say, I wouldn't call it failed, but we have not appropriately focused. Now, if you ask anyone on the street, that why do you want to go to a library? Then they might say that, yes, I want to go to a library to read a book or to, to do access internet and so on. They would say that, when did you last visit a museum or last visit? They would say, oh, last time, you know, last summer holiday, I had some time and I took my children or 15 years ago. Because people often do not see that the cultural heritage information has something to offer. And we have failed that. Cultural heritage information has everything to offer right from our past to the future, right from sustainable development to our community heritage, to our asset. Now, and there is a huge value to it, direct and indirect. Now, we, we have not really focused on that. Uh, actually, I'm now doing a project um, with, um, with um, uh, NGS and NMS to see what people did during the lockdown period about their sort of, you know, digital access and so on, whether there is something that we, we, we can see that something is emerging there and there is a clear interest. So again, public libraries, libraries and cultural uh, institutions, they have a massive role to play in creating, like as education institutions have a massive role to and socially recognized role to play to create future citizen Libraries and cultural institutions also have an equal role to play to create future city, responsible citizens who can handle information and know how to access, use, create, and share information responsibly. Great, thank you very much. So there's a follow-up sort of sting question from uh, around that, which is, um, are you aware of any research that looks at a correlation between the decline of public library funding kind of infrastructure and professionalism and a kind of a correlation with information poverty. So as you were saying there, I guess one of the challenges is that investment in the sort of the infrastructure, if is the flip side of that 
you know, are, is there research which shows, well, basically, if, you, if you're not investing in that space? Uh, that there have been there have been some study um, in the UK done by um, Rita Marcella and her group uh, uh, at Robert Gordon University as to how public library funding has created more information poverty. Um, she has done some work, and then in, in particularly information poverty in the context of in the you know citizenship and then political um, views and so on. Uh, people in um, in if there have been some studies, uh, you know, I, I cannot say offhand, but I, I know there have been some studies by the IFLA group, um, you know, and and some came in IFLA journals as to how public libraries can play um, a major role. Incidentally, and this I'm saying, uh, Donna Schieder, who was the the former uh, president of IFLA, was uh, in one of my projects in Africa. And she used to always, everywhere she went, and she used to always say that public libraries can really play a major role. But I'm really very sad to see that public libraries are almost sort of, you know, cash strapped so much and they are reduced. Now, there is a, there is a bit of work by B.D. Castledon as well in, in Newcastle, who, is, who has demonstrated that how in the absence of funding and funding support, how volunteers can create, you know, some kind of or bridge the gap. But I don't think that's the right solution. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we've got so we'll try and get to all of the all of the questions, but we've got well, well there's more questions coming in here. Uh, the so one sort of kind of metrics question. Um, interesting presentation. Thank you very much. When will the last kind of, so you showed some ONS stats. So what's the lead time on that for sort of the 2019, 2020 data to be made available? Uh, the, the, the ONS stats usually come around um, May, June, around that time. So the data that I have shown is the data that came out last year. That's the latest data available. Um, with the, with the sustainable development data that came out in December, 2020. Sorry, December, yeah, December, 2020. So it's only six weeks old. So right. I tried to look at the latest data, but there is always, as you can see, when the report that came out in 2020, that covers data up to 2018. So there is always kind of 12 to 18 months gap between sort of you know publication of and the date last time the data that they had, um, with regard to the U UN uh, statistics, there is slightly longer delay because they have to collect data from all the countries around the world. So there is, I think, the, the delay is a year more. Okay, great. Um, uh, so there's been some interesting questions as well about. Um, Kind of trusts and relationship with the with the public, um, but one of the uh, one of the uh, attendees has an interesting question around: If you had a magic wand, what literacy skill would you give every person? And given the gender gap, would there be something you would give to sort of males versus females? Okay, um, I, I think. Um... First of all, you know, I wish I had a magic wand <laughs> and could answer the question um, the best way I can. But what I what I think is that here is a difference between, and this is something we often um, kind of uh, forget. Now, information literacy and literacy, there is a significant difference. Literacy is that you can give the same kind of skills for reading to people in a class or in a group. And once they learn, they will never, they will not forget. So, you know, 10 years down the line, they use this or hundred years down the line, they can read, use the same skills to read and understand. Okay. They may need, you know, more subject knowledge. That's a different thing, but the basic skills that is required with regard to information skills, as we discussed, there are four levels of skills that is required to access and use information, the digital, uh, the internet access, and therefore, every time you change your mobile phone, every time you change your computer, every time you have your new internet service provider, et cetera, there is some sort of skills required. 
Then the basic five digital skills, again, those are five basic digital skills, but we all know that the new formats always come up. So we do not know MPEG format or, or, or JPEG format and what is the difference, you know, what is the latest standard of that format and so on. So that's again, the digital skills. Then we need the information skills. The information skills are again, more, as I said, cognitive skills, more sort of advanced level of skills that is needed. And that is where the context comes in. And that is where your question is very important is that how do we offer in, you know, information skills, which is appropriate and therefore information skills should be contextualized within the context of a person within the context of the domain and within the context of the environment. Like someone, for example, coming from a foreign country to Britain may need a different level of information skills. Someone in a particular context of health may need a different set of information skills compared to in another discipline, in another domain. Similarly, for example, you know, information skills have to be contextualized with regard to people's kind of lifestyle, people's age and so on. Uh, it, is not, it is not one size fits all. And that is where the problem is. We try to fit in a one size fits all approach and that's where it fails. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna try and get a couple of other um, questions in as well. Um, can you provide, so we talked about publishing data I wonder if you could say something about, is it useful for publishing? Is there a best way to publish data in a way that's understandable by the public? And does the library, can the library help support that? Certainly, yes. Uh, you see, okay, now we, we all, the, the library and information people, remember when we publish data, uh, and this is a difference between uh, you know, publishing uh, data and publishing an article or publishing a book. Now, <clears throat> that we need to understand first. Uh, when we publish a book, we, anyone with the reading skill can take that out and read and, and sort of, you know, they need some disciplinary knowledge and so on. Whereas, even if you have the disciplinary knowledge, even if you have the skills, it is very difficult to understand the data set unless the context is provided. And that is where metadata comes. So one of the major problems with publishing data is that we do not really have, except for certain fields which have been historically kind of, you know, very widely shared amongst people like astronomical data, for example, where machine, um, you know, data is generated by machines. In many cases, data is, and that's, you know, it is very obvious that, you know, two, two years ago, I was invited to give a kind of, you know, data and information access panel uh, by uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. And I was sharing the panel with the head of the statistics office in the United Nations. What he said was very important. He said that, look, we came up with this sustainable development goals and with all the kind of, you know, targets and so on, but we do not know how to measure data. How do we know that this person or this data is needed to measure gender gap, or this data is needed to measure people's information capabilities or information access and use? He said there are certain data which is collected by machine and then can be used because there's a scientific fields like climatological data, for example. But impact of climatological data on specific areas, we really do not have kind of agreed standards and measures. And that is what the key problem with publishing data. Publishing data comes with a lot of added requirements so that people can make sense of that. Okay, I'm going to have one last provocative question for you, Gabinda. Uh, as well as official and public bodies, we're beginning to see platforms like Twitter take a stance against misinformation. Should they and others be required to take such an active and positive role? So think about referring to open data sources, or is there too much risk in going down this road? So this will be your last question for uh, this afternoon. and. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try uh, to be quick. Um, I am not uh, an expert in kind of, you know, data governance and, and data policies and so on. But what I can tell you is based on my experience. Um, now, if you are a publisher, for example, and you are likely to publish something, and then you have, a, you have created a website, for example, and then where people can go and publish. 
would you be would you feel responsible that people publish all kinds of wrong information hatred all kinds of you know misinformation and so on probably not because you know being providing a service providing a platform publishing something comes with certain responsibilities so if you make some platform available where people can come and people can share and and that's that's wonderful but that comes with you know certain responsibilities as well and therefore i know it is difficult technologically but that does not take away the responsibility so if you are the newspaper editor anything goes on to the newspaper you could be held responsible for that yeah so why why can't you extend that to a digital platform i would imagine that you know it's kind of you know the responsibility still lies whether you take bring out something in in print form or digital form 